is amazing what you can do when you can concentrate and focus as a young individual. When I was a young boy, my parents wanted me to be a musician. And uh, to, to be very good at it, you have, to, you have to study. You can't just practice 15 minutes a day and get anywhere. You notice that she was studying and practicing 30 hours a week. And every person that wants to become great at something has to be able to focus more than 5, 10, 15 hours a week on a particular thing. You just can't. You're never going to become the greatest at it unless you don't. Now, of course, if you're going to college and you're studying either medicine or something like that or engineering, you're going to be studying quite a bit. It's not something like you can just walk in there and know everything. You have to learn it. And, uh, but the key is when we are younger, and uh, this is for uh, people that are younger, it's easier to be able to master things and concepts um, when you're younger, especially in these, these particular areas such as the arts or even in sports. And uh, many of the gymnastics uh, uh, individuals that you see in, um, in, in the college, uh, in the Olympics, uh, they started at a very young age. You don't start being a gymnast at 18, 19 years old. It's just too late. In fact, you're done by you're in your mid-20s at the most. I say that because it's not only gymnastics, but it's anything. God gave us a mind, yet we have a lot of things that distract us. This morning, I want to share with you in our continuing study on the Apostle Paul what his passion was. His passion was being called of God to be able to declare the whole counsel of God. Not a part of it, but the whole counsel of God. And today in the age of specialization, because of the tremendous amount of knowledge that we have, uh, and it was prophesied by even Daniel that knowledge would increase in the last days, it caused us to be able to uh, split things up into various different uh, uh, Academias, in other words, different uh, specializations. Unfortunately, with that, we have a tendency to become great in one area and not so good in other areas. One of the greatest problems today is with all of the information technology that we have in the media is that, especially whether we're young or older, we can get so caught up on looking at a phone and looking and just wanting to know what's going on in other people's lives that we waste a lot of the, 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 the intelligence that God gave us and we lose out on a lot. And of course, then all of a sudden we blame it on other individuals and we say, oh, because we're a victim and, and you, know, you jump on that bandwagon and, and you'll always be a victim, okay? If you jump on that crowd, then you're gonna be a victim and you're gonna realize that you're never gonna really get anywhere. You're never not. You're just gonna be in the group of a victim. Uh, the victims. That's it. But what you want to do is say, you know, I'm not a victim. I'm a child of God. And when we look at it from God's point of view, okay, we're a child of the king. We're no longer victims. We were once. But in Christ Jesus, he lifts us out of that place. And we're a brand new creation in God. That's what the Bible says. Now, we're going to talk about the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul was in a unique individual because he had a trained brain. He was a Roman citizen, but he was also, he sat under the feet of one of the greatest um, Jewish historians, Gamaliel, and he understood the Jewish law. And he even said, as he was a Pharisee, blameless to the law, he did the best he possibly could following the law, and he was brilliant. But he also understood Greek and, and Roman philosophy, and he could, uh, he was convinced, though, before he met the risen Lord that he was right. He was so convinced that he was arresting Christians and even putting his approbation on their being condemned to death. And it was on his way to go ahead and bring more Christians and put them into prison that he has a meeting with the risen Lord. Now I bring that up because there are a lot of individuals in, in our society today and in America and probably in your own family that find themselves thinking they're absolutely right, but they're absolutely wrong. Okay, and uh, you know, it's, it's something that you can think you're so right, but be so wrong until God opens your eyes. There is only one truth. There's not many truths. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say, I have a lot of truths. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So let's look into what Paul, uh, what was the secret of Paul's being able to fulfill this passionate desire to preach the whole 
counsel of God. Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. And we're going to go through scriptures, and I'm going to kind of highlight some of the, the very important port, uh, points and the historical context of why Paul, his whole life, was led by only one passion. Sometimes in our lives, we've got too many things we're doing, and we don't concentrate. Every time you break up your life into many different passions, you're going to find that other things suffer too. In college athletics, there's very few individuals that can major in two or three sports. There are some. There are anomalies. But usually, you've got to focus on one thing to become the best. Paul wanted to focus on fulfilling the calling of God in his life. And that leads me to this whole idea of what is your calling in life? Think about it as we read this scripture. Paul said this, I know how to be abased and I know how to, be about, to abound. And everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, Paul was a well-rounded individual because he, he wasn't born in a sugar-coated lifestyle. You know, he, he wasn't handed a silver platter of all money and things like that. He had to work hard for wherever he got. And there's a lot of individuals that in this world, they're just gifted by their family with all kinds of riches and things like that. And what happens is I heard countless story after story of individuals who just say, I don't understand. I gave my kids everything. The reason... If you give your kids everything that they ever want, they still be like children when they get older. They just want everything given to them. But there's something about hard work. There's something about exercising the brain to discover things and to be able to use the creativity that God gave in our brains that can cause us to be able to st uh, stand out uniquely, not as a failure in life, but as a great success, such as the Apostle Paul. He said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That undergirded his whole life, whether it was on a mountaintop, whether it was in a valley, whether he was hungry, or whether he had everything. He said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians chapter 4, we go on in, in, in this, and this is where I want to focus on today, because the goal of Paul's life on his third missionary journey was to complete the call of God, which was go to the center of government, the center of the economic uh, world, the center of all the wisdom and knowledge at that particular time, and it was the center of the Roman Empire. And I want you to think about that right now, because we as Christians need to concentrate not just on preaching to ourselves, but shining as a light in the modern day Roman Empire, which is Western civilization, which is the greatest country of the Western civilization is the United States of America. And the parallel between the Roman Empire system of government and the United States is so absolutely interwoven economically, politically, and now unfortunately socially, that we are called a republic. And it comes from the whole idea of the Roman system of government. Now, Paul said this in Philippians chapter 4, verses 22 to 23. All the saints greet you, especially those who are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Now, Philippians is a, is a collection of writings that Paul wrote while he was under house erect rest in Rome. He's in Rome, and this was his passion to go there. But think of it. Do you think he would have went there if he knew what was going to happen to him when he got to Rome? I mean, how many people would go ahead and say, you know what? I desire so much to go ahead and preach the gospel in another country, and when you get there, you realize you're going to be arrested, and you're going to be put in prison, and eventually you're going to be executed. I mean, it's not something that you're going to be rejoicing in. Hey, guess what? I'm going on a missionary journey. Well, the Apostle Paul knew exactly what was going to happen to him when he went there, but he still went. It brings me to my whole focus and point. You see, your passion is going to determine your destiny, and sometimes your destiny is not the easiest way down here but it ends up fulfilling the will of God. 
And that's extremely important. I'll say it again. Your destiny is determined by your passion. I'm talking about down here on this earth. And what you do down here on this earth. You can waste your time in a particular area and just enjoy the blessings of God down here and forget totally about the calling of God on your life or you could fulfill the call of God that would be upon your life. Now, not all of us are called to be the Apostle Paul, but we're all called to be Christians and to be a witness of his character and his goodness, not only to each other, not only to a few individuals, but to the whole society. We're supposed to be the light, not just of the, 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 the church, but the light of the, the world, the cosmos, the orderly arrangement of things. And that's what the word world means in Greek. It's, it, we get the word cosmos, it means world. So that's what we're supposed to be doing, being a light to the cosmos, the whole orderly arrangement. And one of the deficits in American Christianity today is that we are not engaging the world with the whole counsel of God because we're afraid of the opposition. And we've dropped the ball. But I really believe that God always loves the church so much he brings us to a place of correction. Why? Because basically sin starts crouching at the door and its desire is for those even in our own church and for our kids and things like that and the school systems. And all of a sudden we wake up and go, wow, what are we doing here? And I believe that's starting to happen. I believe the sleeping giant of the church is beginning to wake up and realize we've got to get more involved in society and not just going ahead and helping the victims, but we've got to show them, hey, you don't have to be a victim. You're a child of the king. You are an individual who has been blessed of God with eternal life. Paul didn't come into the world and the book of Acts doesn't say, you know, him and Barnabas turned the church upside down. He says they turned the world upside down. They, turned, they changed the orderly arrangement of things upside down. One of the biggest problems that I see in my heart about the lack of involvement of the churches in America have to deal with the idea of being able to influence society. Influencing educational systems. Where 90, this is the statistics I'm giving you. Over 90% of all college professors, okay, advocate a worldview which has not God in it at all. How do you expect your kids to come out of college believing in God when 90% of all of the professors are absolutely trying to convince them that there is nothing but the idea of creation uh, uh, of evolution and creation by a God is just non-existence because there are no facts to prove it. And you expect your kids to be able to not have this inculcated in them. It, it's just not going to happen. But when we look at the evidence of the Apostle Paul, he not only just preached to the Jews, he preached to the Gentiles. And, and I've got news for you, if you don't understand it, a Gentile was anybody who wasn't a Jew, meaning all of the Romans too. But the interesting thing is he says, all the saints greet you, especially those who are of Caesar's household. What do you mean by that? He's under house arrest, but those in Caesar's household, his own relatives, we don't know. It could have been one of his wives or one of his mistresses. We don't even know. Could have been one of, one of his sons, one of his um, um, aunts or uncles. We don't know. But we do know that Paul had an influence in the one who is controlling the whole government. So for those who think that Christians shouldn't get involved in politics, well then, explain to me why the Apostle Paul even wasted his time trying to go ahead and witness to those that were in the highest office in the Roman government. Why would he be witness to them? But he won them over to Christ. Well, how did he get that way? Again, we're back to this idea. Did Paul really know what was going to happen to him when he went to Rome or did he just have this fanciful desire? I want to be a missionary. Well, we're going to look at the third missionary journey, his last missionary journey that we know. In Acts chapter 19, verse 21, when all these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia. Macedonia is around Greek Greece and in between is water and then you got the land of Turkey. 
I'm on my way to Jerusalem. After I have been there, I must also see Rome. This was his desire. And again, I want you to keep in the back of his mind. You think he had any idea of what was going to happen to him? Well, remember when he was commissioned by Jesus, when he saw this tremendous, tremendous vision, but he, he heard a voice, okay? And this Jesus saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And of course, he gets this revelation, and then after he receives his eyesight, Jesus told him, I'm going to show you the things that you must suffer for my name. And there is a suffering that happens when you're a Christian. That's why a lot of Christians never allow anybody in colleges to know that really they're a Christian. Why? Because you know you're going to end up being persecuted. Somebody's going to accuse you of, of microaggressions just because you said you were a Christian. Just because you said you were a Christian can upset individuals. They don't even realize why. Because they have been basically brainwashed into believing that Christianity is a bigoted, a racist organization, which is not true. And if it's not true, if lies, where do they come from? Well, Jesus said the devil was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. So therefore, Antichrist which is the devil, basically, is the one who is behind all of the lying that goes on in politics today. And it's sickening because it's very hard to find truth. If it's very hard to find truth in the media, in Hollywood, and in our school systems today, well, I got news for you. That's just a, a prime example of the heavy influence of Satan, who's the liar and a murderer from the beginning, in our society. I know a lot of Christians say, well, yes, I don't want to hear about that. Let's just make me happy. I could give you a sermon to tickle your ears. I could make it, I could, I could really make you feel good. But guess what? You're going to go out into the real world, and maybe you don't necessarily care about it too much, but if you have kids, the world is even a worse place than it was when I was growing up. Because at least we had a double standard and everybody recognized it. Now, the one standard that is being trumpeted all over Hollywood, the media, the music world, is ungodliness. And to think that Sunday morning for two hours a day is going to go ahead and counter all of the ungodly influences that your kids go through in society, you're sincerely deceived. You're just deceived. But there's something that we can do about it. Let's get back to the Apostle Paul. So here it is. We find Paul's got a desire to go to Rome. Does he know what's going to happen there? Well, the Bible says absolutely. And yet he still has the passion to be able to fulfill the call of God in his life. He's not afraid. He's not afraid of being rejected. He's not afraid of confrontation. He's not afraid to stand for the truth regardless of what's going to happen to him. This is his passion. Why? Because, well, we're going to read about it. In Acts chapter 20, verses 20 to 22, uh, 20, yeah, 22 to 23, we read this. I see now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things will happen to me, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. Now, wait a minute. T today, American Christianity, they would say, I'll rebuke you. That's a false prophecy. Because God, all he wants to do is to bless my life with everything. That's the American dream. But here, the Apostle Paul says, the Holy Spirit is testifying. He's prophesying. Chains and tribulations await me. That's so contrary to American Christianity. We're trying to go ahead and be like snowflakes like they teach kids to be where you know you melt at the signs of any kind of thing that is against your feelings and makes you feel bad. That's not the real world. That's a world that we created in American, in American society that will not hold the test of time. Because this panacea that we've created is gonna come down one day, the Lord Jesus tarries because we cannot continue 
to be able to do what we're doing with all the debt that we have piled up. I'm sorry to bring in facts and truth, but that is the truth. If you got time, sit down and figure out on paper, write the zeros down what $21 trillion is all about. And then add every single year about 500 billion. Some years it's a trillion, some years it's only 500 billion, a half a trillion. Just keep adding it. And then multiply it by, okay, that whole amount by the interest rate that we have to pay because we're borrowing that money. It's true, we get good rates, maybe 3%. Two and a half percent, okay. But you add it up and you're gonna say, there's no way that this can continue. But that's the truth. But then again, Jesus said, you know, the truth it will set you free, but we'd rather stay just looking at our cell phones and just say peace and safety and just make me feel good. That wasn't the way the apostle Paul was. So let's continue on. In Acts chapter 20, verses 25 to 28, Paul says this, and indeed now I know that all of you among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. There's evidence here that he realizes I'm going to go to Rome and I'm going to preach the gospel, but most likely I'm going to not make it out of Rome because there's a persecution going on there. You see, he didn't run away from the difficulty that faced him as being a Christian. He faced it head on with the grace of God. And he didn't do it in anger, and he didn't do it in yelling. But Paul was a great, great intellectual that could sit down with everyone, and he just shared the gospel. That's what he did. He sowed the seeds, and he said, you must be born again, or you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That Jesus Christ died on the cross for all the sins of mankind, and salvation is a gift. And those who believe in his name, he gives them the right and the authority to become children of God, not born of the flesh or the human uh, womb, but born by the will of God. Your sins can be forgiven, and you can have eternal life. Now, to the Romans, that was extremely important because the Roman Empire was further along in their uh, destruction than we are in America today. You see, the bubble had already popped in the economics of Rome and in the politics of Rome. Everybody knew that all of the Congress and all the senators were corrupt. And they were, they were basically paying off armies and paying off. And basically the, the taxes went higher and higher and higher. So the people had lost tremendous faith in the Roman Empire. And the good statesmen were long gone because they gave up. Because the Caesars that were in power were absolutely mad with the idea that they were gods. They didn't last very long either. They were all constantly being assassinated. But you see, the love of money is the root of all evil, not money. The love of money. If that becomes your passion, even Jesus said, what's it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul. That's the, what got me thinking before I was a Christian. Because like many, I had a lot, but yet I was miserable inside. At 24 years old, I gave my heart to Christ and he set me free. And he opened my eyes to see. Well, we follow Paul and he says this, Therefore, in verse 26, I testi testify to you this day that I'm innocent of the blood of all men. You see, this basically is his epitaph. He's basically writing his own eulogy. He's basically allowed by the Holy Spirit to put down how he saw what his life was about and how he finished the course. He ran the race, finished the course, and now he was waiting for a crown of glory to be given to him because he was faithful in declaring God's whole counsel. Not a part of it, not an area of specialization, but the whole counsel of God. Amen. Verse 27, for I have not shunned to declare you the whole counsel of God. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. That overseer is really an elder. 
In other places, it translated bishops to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And then Acts chapter 21, verses 10 to 15, the continuing prophecies about what's going to happen to him if he ends up going to Jerusalem and then eventually to Rome. And he still says, this is what my life is all about. He wasn't afraid of death. He wasn't afraid of, of rejection. He wasn't afraid of confrontation. You see, he had this one passion. He just focused on that, like that, that little girl. I mean, she was young. I don't remember how old she was, eight years old, 10 years old, 10 year old girl doing what she's doing. But 30 hours a week, she's focused on that. I can guarantee you, she's not looking at her cell phone eight hours a day. She's not watching TV eight hours a day. If she's watching any kind of TV, it's tr probably trying to watch those gymnasts who have already become individuals that won gold medals or even silver medals. She probably watched them. She watched their mannerisms. She watched how they train. She learned from it. Then she said, I'm going to sit under individuals who know what they're talking about. And that becomes her passion. But see, back to originally, that's the mind that God gave you. God gave you a tremendous ability. And what is this ability to be able to think? What, what damages this, this drive that we could have? Well, let me name a couple of things. A bad upbringing, where you watch your parents, who, who just, and you just basically did what your parents did. They watched TV after they come home from work, and you watched it. They let you do that. They used the TV as a babysitter, and you just passively watched these cartoons with this frivolous nonsense up there while inculcating in your brain all of these these ungodly uh, mor morals that uh, whatever the ones who create this stuff want to inculcate into society, thinking they're going to make it a better society. But yeah, where's the church? Well, we're doing our job. We're just preaching the love of Jesus. Well, guess what? The world is preaching love too. Oh, so you're preaching love? Oh, good. Then we have a lot in common. No, the love of God rebukes and it disciplines and it corrects things that are in error. You say, well, I, why did you stop this person who wanted to commit suicide? Well, because I loved them and I didn't want to curb them from, yeah, you didn't, yeah, you didn't want confrontation. You didn't want to sit down and be able to go ahead and do something about it. You saw what was happening to your friend who began to drink a little bit too much or do too many drugs or start going down a wayward path. Well, I, you know, I didn't want to interfere in his liberty. You see, that's the problem. You see, in America, we believe that liberty means you can do whatever you want to. And trust me, I don't care necessarily what you want to do, except for one thing. If you screw your life up, it always comes up that I got to pay for it somehow because society is going to have to pick up the burden. So like I always used to say, this one girl said, you know, it's a free country. I can have many children as you want, as I want to. And I said, yeah, you can have as many as you want, but don't expect me to pay for them. Okay? The reason why I didn't have a lot of children is because I understand how much it costs. And you're banging them out like crazy, like, you know, that, like you know, the world's just going to take care of you. Well, I'll tell you right now, you might have the world take care of you, but they're going to end up in poverty just like you. They're going to end up victims just like you. They're going to end up on a plantation just like you will. While some individuals that are in government, especially the whites that are just rich and they like to be these liberals that want to just give out this idea that they're so caring about people. Yet they got walls around their houses and they send their kids to the best schools. And meanwhile, these individuals that they call victims and we're going to champion you. Do you ever see them lift up a hand to really help them out of it? Check the welfare payments and check the food stamps. They haven't gone up that much in the last 15 years. They're designed to keep you at a poverty level. But that's the truth. And no, not too many people want to speak this. And the only reason I speak this is because I allow the spirit of prophecy to speak through me once in a while. And I, get, I don't even get in trouble anymore because I don't care. I want the truth of God to go out and people set free. I'm sick and tired of seeing children be destroyed through drugs and alcohol and game warfare. And no, I'm not a racist. As anything, I'm a human racist. I believe in the human race, and I think that every color, every single person has a right to be able to know the truth because Jesus said, you know the truth and it will set you free. I'm just waiting for the day that 
those in power will go into these areas and the ghetto areas and where they got all this gang warfare and sit down the highest powers and they'll sit down and say let's fix this this fix this problem then you'll find that some want to get out help the ones that want to get out and then they can go back and help but I found that there are a lot of individuals that are just like a lot of individuals in the church they're just comfortable they're in a comfort zone and they don't have a lot but they got enough as long as they don't have to work too hard and they can watch their TV and they have a cell phone, they're fine. To me, that's slavery. It's a modern form of slavery. I don't care what color you are. The biggest problem we have in America is economic slavery. It has nothing to do with color. It has to do with individuals that put you in a position where you're all grouped together. Kind beget kind and never forget that principle. Whatever, so you, whatever you sow, you reap. The Apostle Paul wasn't concerned about that, and this is what he said here in verse 27. I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. And what is the whole counsel of God? It's not just that Jesus loves you. I remember when I first got saved, I went around and said, Jesus loves you. You know what that does? That has about as much conviction, okay, as something dead. It doesn't do a doggone thing. Okay, God loves you. Who doesn't think that God loves them? What do you think? Going to go around and, and, and th oh, wow, I thought God hated me. No, God is supposed to love. That does nothing. It doesn't convict anybody. But if a child had a father say to him, I love you, there's a big difference. But if a father says, I love you, and it beats him to a pulp, the kid's going to realize that whatever he says means nothing. You see, it's deeds and actions that change people's lives. I remember reading a book of um, Indian chiefs' famous lines. I even said one day I was going to bring that book in. I thought, when I go on vacation, I usually try to find a bookstore if there's any left anymore. And uh, I try to find a, a good book to read. But one of the biggest problems that the Americans had when Christians were trying to witness to them is that the Indians were saying that the preachers don't practice what they preach. They had no problem with the words of Jesus about family and caring and everything, but what they did have a problem with is the fact that they didn't live up to what they truly meant. And one of the famous things is that they said that, that the white man speaks with a forked tongue. He says one thing and he does another. He breaks every treaty that he makes, and what do you expect the Indians to want to do? There were, some Christ, there were some Indians that became Christians, but they didn't go to American churches. But they practiced the teachings of Jesus because they said, we don't find a problem with the teachings of Jesus. We have a problem with, with the, the whites that have come here and preaching Jesus because they're not really following what Jesus is saying. And once the, the, um, the Bible was translated into the Indian languages, they scoffed it up. Why? Because the principles of Jesus were tremendous. By the way, most of them didn't read the Old Testament. They just hung around the New Testament, and they talked about Jesus. And it really changed their lives. But it makes you wonder, how many Christians today? I mean, they're Christians, but yet, if they were in a court of law, would there be enough evidence to convict them after the judge got done interrogating to find out what they believed? You can't be a Christian according to the scriptures and practice immorality according to the word of God. Lying, cheating, or stealing. No matter what your motive for doing it is, it's wrong. You just can't do it. It's impossible. There's only one word. Now you say, well, Paul never mentioned these. Of course he did. He spoke against homosexuality. He spoke about these things. In fact, he said the reason for that is because they turn away God. They refuse to retain God in their knowledge. Verse Romans chapter 1. Therefore God turned them over to a reprobate mind. Reprobate means void of any sense of a right and wrong according to God's standard. And they change the, the incorruptible God into a corruptible beast. In other words, they worshiped and served creation rather than the creator. You say, what does that mean? They think of Hollywood, American Idol, and all these things like that. 
There's nothing wrong with caring about and watching people's talents. There isn't. But I'm telling you right now, if you want to do the will of God, it's very simple. I can't tell you to do the will of God. Why don't you go before God and say, God, am I fully believing the whole counsel of God? Or have I have adapted my form of Christianity the way I think? I told the Lord, I don't really want to see any more truth. I don't want to see things the way they really are. Because when you see things the way they really are in God's eyes and God's heart, then, then you've got to make a decision. Either you just become a Jonah and just want to run away and say, you know what? Everything is lost. Or you say, no. I'll go ahead and I'll speak. But you know what? When you do speak the whole counsel of God, don't think you're not going to end up like the Apostle Paul. And the whole purpose of this message today was by the time I got done reading these scriptures, the Lord said this. He said this to my heart. He said, son, think of it. Paul's having a great time in his missionary journeys and winning a lot of people to Christ. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord puts upon his heart, he's got to go to Rome, but you're going to be persecuted tremendously. Rome, in, Rome represents the seat of political and economic power of the whole known world at that time. And he said the church in America has a decision to make whether they will engage the government, engage society with the character of God listed in the Bible, the whole counsel of God, or will they run from the calling of God and preach only a part of the council thinking they're doing the will of God. And don't tell me that just because a church has 60,000 or 100,000, 30,000, that they must be doing something right. When Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. If you see compromise going on, then you need to say to yourself, wait a minute. Why are they compromising? Well, because we want to win as many as we can. Which leads me to this focus point. And this is a, a revelation. You can take it. Do whatever you want with it. But you know, before he went to Rome, guess where he went? He went to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a place that had a mixture of Christianity, legalism, and everything. Paul, representing the purity of the gospel, is going to go there knowing that he's going to have some issues. And guess who ends up putting him into a place where he gets arrested and tried with heresy and things like this and brought before King Agrippa. And then Festus, who was the Roman uh, procurator in that particular area, could make a final judgment. But Paul, because they already heard that Paul is preaching a message that is uncompromising when it came to the idea of you're saved by your faith and by grace not by works of the law. There was a mixture going on. I close with these scriptures and then we'll just, a couple of points about them. Acts chapter 26. And this is the story. He goes to Jerusalem. The Jews are coming against him. Because they're saying, you know what? He's messing things up here. They even said to Paul, Paul, look how many of the Pharisees and the priests have believed in Messiah and they're all zealous for the law. Mixture. And as sure as I'm standing here, the Holy Spirit said, son, this is what America is like in American Christianity, varying degrees. You've got some churches that are absolutely welcoming individuals that are transgender, homosexuals, anything you want to be, because we love, and you're all welcome here. Now, I'm not saying that we should be against these people, but we cannot advocate the lifestyle if it contradicts the moral laws which are of the character of God. Amen. But you've got whole churches and whole denominations that are, that are going ahead and saying these things. It's a mixture. 
And those who come against this by saying it's sin are going to end up in the same place that the Apostle Paul. They're going to be, again, brought before King Agrippa. Now, the interesting thing about King Agrippa, wait a minute, how could he be a king in the Roman Empire? He was a king of the Jews, you see. He was representing under the Roman powers the highest authority in the Jewish religion when it came to civil law. If you wanted anybody prosecuted for a crime, under Jewish law, you had to go to King Agrippa. And of course, he had to check, make sure that it was in line with Roman law, but then he could go ahead and find, you know, he could go ahead and make a judgment. But this is what he says here. When Paul's before him, in verse 13, Paul already speaks to him, and he tells him why I'm here. And he tells him about the whole gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why he's here. He tells about his own personal testimony, how God sets him free. Fills him with the Holy Spirit. Changes his life. He's so convincing, uh, convincing that they even say, you know what? You've almost persuaded me to become a Christian, but he didn't. And then they finish with this line. In verse 31, when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves saying, this man has do, done nothing deserving of death or change. And then Agrippa, the king, said to Festus, the Roman guy who could make the final say, he says, this man might have been set free if he did not appeal to Caesar. In other words, Paul, you just had to go ahead and not go to Rome. Just don't try to influence politics. Don't try to influence the school system. Don't try to say anything about Hollywood. Don't say anything about the media. Just love. Don't say nothing, Paul. And you'll be free to be able to practice your Christianity the way you want to. But see, Paul's passion was to declare the whole counsel of God no matter what the circumstances would be. Which leads me to the conclusion. Think of it this way. Every one of us is in, put into a position where we either compromise our beliefs for the sake of peace, for the sake of uh, just, you know, just getting along. We have to do it. You work in the school system. They tell you, you can't mention God, you can't bring the Bible in, you can't pray, you can't do anything. And you do it. Why? Because you're getting a salary and you say, well, I'm working for the government and that's what they require and that's it. But don't you get it? That something changed because we used to be able to pray. I mean, I, I'm old enough to remember when we could pray in school. So what happened? That is the key. If it always was that way, that's one thing. But if we lost the ability to do that, where was the church when these rules and regulations were being proposed in Congress? Well, I'm a Christian. I don't get in politics involved in politics. You're in a democratic republic where we put the leaders in by voting. In other words, thus says the Lord, you got what you voted for. And I'll leave it at that. Because I know the statistics of who voted for what. And it always comes down to there are other issues rather than there are other issues. There's no more issue important than you fulfilling the call of God in your life to stand fast as a Christian. Because Jesus himself said, through much tribulation, we will enter the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, listen, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. And he said also, man, you should be careful when all the world thinks so wonderfully about you, not only the Christians, but also the unsaved. Oh, he's a nice guy. I like the way he speaks. Because it just means that what you did was you compromised the word of God. You got to the place where you're blinded. And you can't see clear. And that's why the book of Revelation rebuked the early church after all the apostles were gone. He said, you think you see, but you don't understand that you are poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold tried as in a fire. And that your eyes might be anointed that you can truly see. It's our human nature to just want to go ahead and take the easy way out. 
It really is. I mean, I had kids when I was younger. The first thing you want to do when the kids are screaming and yelling is turn the TV set on and put, put some cartoons on. It's a babysitter. And it shuts them up. The kids are screaming, I want ice cream, I don't want it. You're not getting ice cream, it's not healthy for you. Then finally you take the pop and you stick it right in his mouth and he don't care. Okay, I got what I wanted. It's human nature to want to be just appeasing. This gospel of appeasement is something that is a stench in God's nostrils. I had to look up the word appeasement because a lot of people don't know what to appeasement means. It means to protest within silently, but never voice your opinion outside. It's what the world did when they understood that the Jews were being taken and they were putting into prisons and they were being executed. And those in society that weren't Jewish, they were afraid for their lives because if they did not turn in the Jews, then they would be killed. And the ones that stood for truth, such as Diedrich Bonhoeffer, he was ended up being executed because he wouldn't shut up, even after they put him in prison. He came against Hitler and Hitler brought down an order and he said, get rid of this man. He's a vexation to me. Even with all of the persecution and the torture, he won't shut up and his disciples are doing the same thing that he's doing. Get rid of him. Well, those are extremes that I understand. Not all of us are going to be that way. But you all have to make a decision on how much you are willing to go ahead and deny yourself and take up the cross daily and follow after Jesus. At least do one thing. Spend some time before God and say, God, how do I look in front of you? Am I really doing your will? Or am I really doing more of my will? My famous saying of Jesus was, Father, not my will, but thine be done. And he showed us as a human being that we all have to make these choices every single day. Someone said, you should run for politics. I can't do it. Because I'd never get elected, number one. And if I got elected, okay, I wouldn't get anything done. Because I will not be bought with money under the justification, well, I gotta take care of my people. No, I gotta take care of God's business. Man. I'd rather be a voice crying in the wilderness. And I see a whole army of young people rising up, men and women like John the Baptists, saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And they'll have the power of God on their life and they will not compromise. And as they grow bigger and bigger in their ministry, they will not settle back and say, you know what, I've got enough now. Look at my church, I've got 10, 20, 30,000, I'll buy an airplane. No, they won't do that. They'll be like the Apostle Paul. No, I will not, be, I will not allow myself to be controlled by anything by a bank account, by a car, or bills, or anything else like that. I want to wholly preach the full counsel of God. And I don't care about the circumstances. I only want to do God's will. No matter what you think about Dr. Martin Luther King, he'd be so, they would probably be assassinated again, but he wouldn't be assassinated by white people today. He'd be assassinated by his own because he would not be standing for what's going on. He preached the gospel of love, but no compromise at all. He preached the whole philosophy of Mahatma Gandhi, which was nonviolent uh, resistance, which Mahatma Gandhi got by some other person. And they hold on to that thing. And they said, listen, it's going to cost us, but in the end, we'll win. But we will not strike back. We will not get violent. We will always love, no matter what they say, but we will not compromise the truth. And of course... He lost his life for it. The report said that if the, if the whites didn't get a hold of him, the Black Panthers had already marked him to get rid of him because they believed in the violent overthrow at that particular time. He was warned, just like the Apostle Paul, don't go. Come on, they're just sanitation workers. Why in the world do you want to throw yourself when you've been threatened that you're going to be assassinated and killed there? Why, you, you know, it's like it's not a major even battle. Why do you want to go there? Because of injustice. That's why. It's wrong. And I want to change the laws. These laws have to be changed. And he went there. 
And of course, he was assassinated. The irony is that we, many people, they, they triumph him as being this great hero of the modern movement, and yet at the same time, he'd be appalled. If you don't believe it, ask his niece. And she's appalled at what they did to his record. Just like some Christians do to the Apostle Paul, they leave out all the scriptures about how he confronted society rather than just sit still in the mixture and say, ah, what the heck. But I'll admit that I'm tempted. I'm tempted, I'm getting older now. I'm saying, you know what, Lord? What am I gonna do now? You can tell the truth, son. But I no longer blame the people, I blame the leaders in Christ. I blame the shepherds. Because the Lord said, son, it's not the people. The people follow pe leaders. Shepherds, says the Lord, are the ones that lead my people astray. And you know who you are. But I see a revival. Amen. I see it happening before my very eyes, and it has nothing to do with man. It has to do with the will of God. Hallelujah. And I see it. It's going to be individuals that are going to rise up. Hallelujah. And unfortunately, it will not be necessarily established churches because they're too structured around their own kingdoms with their massive million dollar budgets in America. But God will raise up young people. and they, You don't have to be stupid to be a minister. You can be well educated. Read history. You'll find that some of the most brilliant theologians and brilliant preachers were individuals that understood economics. They understood politics. They understood sociology. And they understood the psyche of man. And like the Apostle Paul, they were brilliant individuals who can engage not only the religious world, but also the non-religious world with the defense of the gospel. Let's close our eyes and let's close in prayer. Father, we, we looked at the, the life of the Apostle Paul. He could have been free, but no, he chose. He could have stayed in Jerusalem and just appeased those that were arguing with him and he could have lived out the rest of his life and he probably would have won a lot of people over to the gospel but he wouldn't have been true to the full gospel he would have appeased a lot of individuals with the gospel of appeasement but he chose to preach the gospel of repentance and change you must change and Lord I pray God for each and every one that hears the message today that they would be willing to allow the Holy Spirit to change them and to mold them and make them into the image and likeness of Jesus. That their minds would be renewed in their spirit Lord. That they would know you in the power of your resurrected life. In Jesus name we pray. Amen.